All right. Well, I have Robin. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much. Good to be here, Greg. Um, I thought we might just start. Like, I know you come from a sports psychology background. So, can you just tell us a bit about your background and, and how you got into that world? And we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah. So I guess down the education path, uh, obviously college, university, whatnot, did my bachelor's at Loughborough University in sports psychology. Um, and then I also did my master's at Greenwich University. Um, I guess the way that I got into it, though, wasn't through the educational path. That, it wasn't what sparked the fire for me. Um, it was being an athlete growing up, doing a lot of sport um, with an invisible disability, actually. And uh, having my physical performance impeded meant I had to make up the ground somewhere. And unbeknownst to myself, I was laying the foundations of quite a strong mentality that I, I didn't really know at the time. I was watching a lot of uh, motivational speakers, Les Brown, Eric Thomas, Inky Johnson. And that was my, I guess, gateway into the world of working on your mind. Uh, it wasn't until I went to university, backed up with a, uh, the theorem to sort of, yeah, support what I was putting into place naively. Okay. Can I ask what, what what sports were you doing when you were younger? And and can I ask about the the invisible disability? Yeah, of course. Yeah, open book. Uh, so first of all, sports, everything. Like if you you name it, I did it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, literally anything. I was moving from a young age, so any sport I would do. I think predominantly, I would say a swimmer. I was a national swimmer growing up. Um, but I was playing rugby. I was doing karate. I was doing horse riding. I was doing uh, basketball. Anything you name it, right? Running. Um, so and then I went down into the bodybuilding route. Um, that's my most recent venture. Um, the the invisible disability is Ellis Danlos syndrome, uh, type three hypermobility, and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, a mouthful. Uh, basically, <laughs> the EDS is like uh, the best way to explain it. It's similar to like um, hypermobility, uh, but on a more extreme level. Uh, so my connective tissue is isn't too great, um, and the pot suffers an autonomic nervous condition. Um, so brain fog, dizziness, um, all of those types of things that I think growing up wasn't as bad but got worse as I got older um and as I say it was spending a lot of time in the changing rooms having to get out of sessions early and like you'll know as an athlete that's the worst thing like being out of a training session not being able to compete uh and it it's all sort of built a character where it's like either you give up or, or you keep going and work with what you've got and yeah fortunately it's all built the mindset that I have today and I take into uh working with my clients now okay awesome are you uh, what you're doing from a sporting perspective at the moment so yeah so i uh, most recently has been bodybuilding um but uh last time i competed that was a year ago um and i got injured so it's been a, a long journey back i've uh, just started getting into my running again so um i am very intrigued by the functional fitness space just purely because i think it brings everything together that i love um but we're a ways off competing purely just because of injury unfortunately Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, in your sports psychology uh, background or, or work, who, who do you typically work with? Can you can you talk about like typical clients? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, so, I got sort of introduced into this world by most things you get opportunities right and I was at Loughborough and I got introduced some boxers and uh, I started in the world of professional boxing um, working with some ex-cruiserweight champions and Olympic medalists so yeah really chucked in at the deep end <laughs> to begin with um, but then my my passion's always been in the fitness industry so uh, there's a lot of work with the youth athletes uh, in sports psychology um, is sort of really pushing forward which is great and needs to be worked at a gra grassroots level um, but uh, I really wanted, wanted to get into, I guess, the fitness space. So um, types of athletes, it, it varies. <laughs> Lots of different sports, right? There's a lot of transferable skills when it comes to the mindset side of things. So um, power lifters, strong men, people that run high rocks races, other functional fitness based stuff. Uh, what to a figure skater um, on the same thing that I've worked with uh, <laughs> with a marathon runner. So <laughs> it's very, very different, right? And what what is I mean, maybe this is is dependent on the person as well, but are there any typical problems that people come to you with or not even problems necessarily, things that they're trying to work on? Yeah, like I guess you hit them now on the head, Greg. It varies, right? There's so many different things um, that people work on. I guess confidence is a massive one. Um, and it depends on where they come from as well. If you come from a non-sporting background, because when you think about it, a lot of this, say functional fitness, you don't do that in school. And there's a lot of people that would have gone through school saying that they weren't sporty or athletic and now are running high rocks races. Bloody amazing, right? But like that, 
is still carried with them that identity issue and that desire to prove themselves not necessarily to anyone else but themselves and that version of them the 15 year old self that's still constantly debating what, what it is to be an athlete and there's a lot of discomfort around sitting with that word and labeling themselves as an athlete well to me anyway in my measure if you're running the high rocks race that's pretty athletic right um but people struggle with that so mm -hmm. there's a confidence issue there but at the root an identity crisis um and people don't necessarily want to label it that way but that's really the nuts and bolts of it so uh, you've just got uh, performing pressure struggling on i guess big race days um and with that comes the emotional control navigating emotions on race day um all tricky stuff that people want to work on and uh, i'm happy to help them through yeah certainly like certainly relevant for people in high rocks i would say and and uh, we're recording this the weekend before london which is going to be like the biggest high rocks event ever uh yeah. there, there'll be a ton of first timers doing it as well and a ton of nerves um yes. if if that is like you, you sort of touched on the confidence and maybe even the identity side of things what like if someone is listening to this and they are struggling with that side of things like they're nervous about the event maybe they feel like you know they don't belong there or whatever what mm. type of things would you say to them work with them on how should they go about addressing that other than working with you, is there, is there anything you could share here? <laughs> yeah, look, we're all into in the business of making it tangible, right? Giving people stuff that they can do at home on their own, not necessarily needing to sit down face to face with someone like myself. And um, I think there are elements where you need to. Obviously, it's deeper rooted. But uh, when you're one week out of a, a massive event, you don't want me saying, oh, we're booking a session with me and we'll talk about it. It needs something tangible, right? Um, so I think when you get close to an event, like obviously, you would imagine people get motivated and excited. And some people do, but there's a large pool of people, as you spoke about, that get anxious, nervous, like naturally, like High Rocks events are massive. <laughs> so High Rocks London being one of the biggest events to date is going to be gigantic. And knowing that, seeing that build up on social media, like that's all adding to it, right? Not only, I guess, the added extra uh, pressure is from the internal demands that you're placing on yourself. Say it is your first race, but you're coming from another sport or Maybe you've been doing some simulations and you've got an expectation of race pace and what you want to be able to actually do on the race day. That's all adding pressure and it's all going to mount up to the day. And what you end up creating is, well, for some people, an opt optimist state. But other people, you start to creep out of that optimum zone of performance, right? We start to become too anxious. We know anxiety can, and pressure can be a good thing um because some for some people they didn't have that they'd be complacent they wouldn't really bother it'd be like a park run be like ah, it doesn't really matter so they need something something to get them going but the quantity of that varies from person to person so first of all identifying where you land right let's imagine it on a spectrum from zero percent no pressure at all to a hundred percent like heaps and heaps of pressure like i don't know a world cup penalty kick right that's a lot of pressure and who are you going to have standing over that ball probably someone who thrives in that situation if you could choose right well, you need to identify where you are. And yes, there's an environmental factors that will manipulate that, that you can't control. So say your base is 50% right down the middle. You turn up to High Rocks, um, <laughs> London at the weekend and the, the lights are going, the sounds, everything. There's people everywhere, all looking amazing. <laughs> and you're just starting to, okay, that 50% is starting to grow up 60 to 70. The environment is dictating your pressure level. How do you bring it back down? And now... Commonly, when we're starting to, uh, I guess, doubt ourselves in those moments when we're getting anxious, we end up in that fight or flight state. What are we going to choose to do? And if you're not prepared for it, then it's probably going to be flight. Right? <laughs> we want to be able to actually turn and fight this. Um, and we keep these training logs throughout prep, throughout our however months we've been training. And it's just there, sitting in your training bag, all these weights, these reps, all these times, and everything that you've collected on your Strava, wherever it might be. We don't turn to it, though. We leave it there. That is a primary source of uh, confidence, right? In that moment, you're debating everything and your brain's not taking you anywhere down a positive lane. It's taking you furthest way away from positive performance. It's making you doubt, worry about how you actually perform. When you've got the answers in your pocket for a lot of people. When we're getting, uh, when we have our confidence compromised in those situations, we need something that's going to remind us and give us that boost. And it's not necessarily always watching a motivational video of someone else achieving something great. What have you achieved? What have you gone through? A lot of people have done a hell of a lot of work to get to that, that point, And they just need a reminder. But your brain 
It's not going to remind you when you're in that state. It's anxious. It's in that flight response. So having something there to prompt that, maybe it is just a few things in your training log that's highlighted. Maybe I do a lot with a lot of my athletes. I'll get them to put voice notes down in their voice memos or they'll create a photo album on their app. So they've got maybe videos of their training um, or some of their simulations where they performed amazing so that you can induce that feeling of elation when you need it, that feeling of confidence artificially created, but from an organic, relatable uh, experience, something that you've actually done throughout your prep. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It's, fa it's funny you say it, actually. I've been thinking about this recently. I've been like a bit injured, so not run as much as I wanted in recent weeks. And it's <clears throat> and like, there's so much recency with it. It's like, I've convinced myself, like, I'm not yeah. fit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like going into this event, if I actually think over the last like six months that I've trained, like my training has been like the best it's ever been. I've put in more volume than ever. But because the last like two, three weeks haven't been optimal, like it's, it's, it's easy to forget everything else and like reminding yourself about what you have done and everything you've achieved is, yeah, I, I can see that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Like obviously we look, we know, don't have to be a psychologist to know we have a recency bias. <laughs> we will naturally like lean on the recency stuff. There's something that's happened recently, but like you say, that, that was only a few months beforehand. And obviously, evidence like the stuff you've done in the past will lose its effectiveness as time goes on. But I'm sure you can still think about something that maybe you even did as a child, like something that you accomplished, that if you still just try and reimagine that scenario, it still gives you that, invigorates you, give that moment of confidence. We have those moments, and you want to cling on to them. They're like gold dust. And mm -hmm. but we leave them to just rot away in our training books um, and never give them the light of day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about if there's uh, like someone, say, gets to the event and it is, like you sort of said, it's, it's, it's busy, there's, there's so much going on, it's, there's a lot of excitement and anxiety. Like Aside from like tapping into that confidence side of things, is there like, any maybe like relaxation if someone feels yeah. like they need to calm down, which not necessarily everyone does, admittedly, before an event, but uh, any sort of tips and tricks there? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I guess uh, inducing a relaxation state is very specific to certain people. Right? There's, there's, there's breathing techniques to be able to do that. So four, seven, eight breathing being a really useful one that a lot of people will do. When I say four, seven, eight, that's breathing in for an inhale of four seconds, holding for a count of seven seconds, and exhaling for a count of eight seconds. And that's shown to be a nice sort of relaxing rhythm breathing that people engage in. Um, very helpful. You've got box breathing. So another breathing technique, which is just as simple as breathing in for four seconds, holding for a count of four seconds, breathing out for four seconds, and holding for a count of four seconds. And repeating that process, doing a few rhythms of those, a few sequences of those breaths until you induce that calm state. Typically, slowing down your exhale if we don't want to get into like any breathing patterns slowing down your exhale will down, slow down your heart rate which we know is a physiological sign if it's increased of anxiety so if we reduce it we're doing the opposite right we're going to lower anxiety and our stress um you've got another one that's really good that i do with a lot of my clients is running through uh progressive muscle relaxation so it's built off the premise that inducing um maximum contraction will be followed by maximum relaxation so sequentially going through your muscles and tensing them for about five to 10 seconds and then releasing and then letting the muscles just relax. Again, similar to on a run, if you're nice and relaxed, your muscles aren't tense, you feel calm, feel more relaxed. But as soon as that lactic acid builds up, you start to get more tense. So does the anxiety, right? We know that there's a pair, there's a alliance between the physiological feelings and the emotional state. So there we're manipulating that. But we can go a step further and we go down, I guess, a more of a tailored and individual process, which I'll urge your listeners to start doing this week, is start thinking about songs, songs that induce in a, like that, that relaxed state. It might be a lovely piano piece for some, uh, whereas others, I don't know, it might be a pop hit that they love. Uh, but we all have those songs that we'll tune into to allow us to relax. It could be river sounds or sounds of the rainforest, I don't know. Um, but building a catalog of those so on spotify apple music wherever your choice is building a playlist of cooling down songs and then a playlist of hyping up songs i'm sure you have them already when you think about it you have your gym playlist right um but like you say some people need to relax when they go into a competition um not because they need to be relaxed but they just don't need to be hyped up as much as they are right it's, it's all a balancing act i think a lot of people see emotions as binary it's like kind of a, like it's, i'm relaxed nah not really much taught i'm just like chilled out or i'm really energetic 
So, well, those on themselves are like on a scale as well. You can be a 10 out of 10 energized, or you can be a 1 out of 10 energized. You're still energized, but you're not as energized as you would if it was a 10 out of 10 intensity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Um, in the, in the, high reps can get very tough. So when, uh, like, you know, you're whatever, 45 minutes deep and it's hurting. Yeah. Um, is there, I, I talk to a lot of athletes on here and ask them where their mind goes at those points, what helps to push them forward. Is there, mm -hmm. is there any sort of tips you can give for, for someone on that? If they're, you know, really struggling in a race, where, where should their mind go? Yeah. Uh, good, good question. I think that's what separates a lot of athletes, right? When you get to that point, do you just stop? Do you slow down or what do you do? Um, and it's interesting you say that I was having a chat with a client actually this morning about it. Um, saying there was, it was the, uh, <laughs> it was after the wall balls for them. <laughs> that's where it got really difficult and everyone has their different areas for them. Um, and it was because the physical sensations of, I guess, tiredness started to kick in. So fear and lactic acid, feeling tight, feeling tense. And that naturally led to doubt creeping in. Um, so I guess what you'll find has been some research into ultra, ultra runners. And what they had was they just had a better tolerance of pain. And now I know over this week, you're not going to be able to necessarily increase that. But what you can do is you can increase your awareness of pain. And when we get into those moments where we're starting to debate this, debate whether we're going to continue running, it's often because we're finding ourselves becoming overwhelmed and indulged in the physical sensations. And like anything, if you're indulging in how your legs feel like they're going to fall off, well, naturally your brain's going to start to worry, right? It's going to start to, it's there to keep us alive. So if you think that you're going to, I don't know, snap an Achilles, you're going to obviously want to stop. Anyone would. But the reality of that might not be so great. Obviously, certain circumstances, of course, it can be. Um, but maybe, you know, you've trained this. You know, there's not, not a possibility. I've, I've done this before. Like, I, I have the ability to get there. So it's going through a process of decatastrophizing that, checking yourself, having that prompt. Like, okay, am I right? Who Who is this right now? Is this um, Greg the athlete talking or is this Greg the warrior, right? Who, who is chatting to me right now? Who's giving these voice of self-talk? Who am I listening to? Who am I tuning into? And in those moments, we start to become far too consumed and we ruminate the thoughts. And the more you hear a thought, the more profound it becomes. You ever obviously hear people, they tell themselves a lie so much that it becomes true. They believe it to be the truth, right? Same thing for our thoughts. The more spotlight we give it, the more impact it has. So in those moments, we think of the word distraction as being quite unhealthy. We go to school and if you're told to focus up, like, because you're again, you're distracted, it's a bad thing. Well, Actually, in the world of sport, sometimes having some level of distraction can be healthy. Now, I'm not saying distracted completely that you run the wrong way or you pick up the wrong piece of equipment, right? But like I'm talking about distracted in a healthy, functional manner. So that could be as simple as humming a song. Listen to like I know she can't necessarily listen to music when you're you're at high rock. She's got the speakers blaring out, but humming your favorite song, counting back from a hundred. Where it's something to do to take your mind away from the hole that you've dug it which is in that pain cave right you want to try and just creep out of it a little bit so that would be a strategy that i would definitely deploy but if you want a motivational boost if it's not that you're um too ingrained in your self-talk and you're starting to doubt but just that little bit of doubt's creeping in um we can have words that can cure our motivation so we all have a reason why we well we're running this high rocks london right you've got everyone's got that and i don't claim to know those because they're deep ingrained and personal to yourself so if you're listening to this what i would try to do is over this week write down a list of all the reasons or no, no matter how trivial why you're doing this high rocks race what is your reason for doing it like look, no one's gonna see it be as like vulnerable as you want then go back to that list and try and narrow it down to like three to five things now you've got it a little bit more summarized i want you to go back to that and think of one word a phrase or an acronym that sums up all of those words so it's got some impact behind it it's got some context write that down your arm on race day that's going to be your go-to when things start getting hard when shit gets real we go to that word that word because what it does it's not just a word at that point it actually is a reflection of all the reasons why you're doing this race okay interesting um do you ever, I've spoken with a couple of people in here about um, uh, so motivation in those points.
But then also yeah. sometimes they have to turn to like anger or something that really like fires mm. them up. Like when things are like really getting tough, yeah. anger can be a good fuel. Would you, mm. would you, would you agree with that? Have you seen that before? It varies, right? So I would say I, I have seen it without a doubt and been there, done it myself. Um, it'd be how you construct that and how you direct that anger. Um, so we all have an emotional experience. I call it the emotional cocktail of which these are the emotions I like to experience and these are the intensity or the concentration in which I want to experience these emotions when I'm performing. And they're each different to ourselves. And that's, I guess, how we're going to summarize the, the flow state, how we perform in the zone. We're going to summarize it by an emotional cocktail experience. Anger seems to flag up for quite a lot of people, especially when they're in that zone of feeling like I just need to grit, get through this. Well, inducing that emotion, a lot of people use music to do that, recalling a hard time, whatever it might be, to be able to induce that. It's just whether where that anger is directed. If it's an internal anger taken out on yourself, then my argue, argument would be, is it maladaptive? Is it helpful? Is it not? And now that's obviously quite nuanced and that <laughs> probably ex extends the scope of this conversation. But that would be my own reservation with using that. It'd be how you're actually directing where that anger comes. What's the source of that anger, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and th another sort of thing that you touched on is um, like distraction and then how mm. you, you don't want to pick up the wrong piece of equipment or run the wrong way or something like that, which, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you know about high rocks necessarily, but it is actually very easy to make mistakes in high rocks, do the stations in the wrong order, run mm. the wrong number of laps, things like that. Um, so do you, like I appreciate the distraction side of the, of the pain and the, the toughness, but at the same time, like you do need to maintain a level of concentration in a race. Uh, is there, is there any tips you can, you can give, especially if someone is, has done a few high ups and made several mistakes. Is there any tips you can give them there? In regards to, to what tips to avoid mistakes, uh, avoid mistakes during, during a race when there is like so much going on and they're struggling and there's all the noise and all that sort of stuff going on. Any, any, ways to maintain the concentration or anything like that yeah so i guess there's a there's a few things so uh, i guess to your point there Greg, focus is is an interesting thing um people see it as you're either focused or you're not um and when we say about healthy distractions we're not saying about being fully distracted we're just trying to get you into this realm so is it seen rather than seeing things as binary again we're trying to see things on a spectrum and we're seeing it on a scale and where you're operating and when you start to slip out of that what do you need to do so if i'm becoming too focused healthy distraction gets me back in. If I'm starting to become not, not focused at all, all right, now I need to become a bit more present. So in this situation, you can use a uh, sort of motivational keywords, but you can use focus keywords. So focus keywords are, as it says on a tin, a word to cue your focus. And now the great things about these are they're actually, I guess, domain specific. So for example, if it's a running keyword, it might be very different to if you're doing a wall ball or sled push or whatever it might be. You can have a technical keyword or you can have an emotional keyword. Now, an emotional keyword would, I guess, cue how you feel the movement. So if I was to break down a 1K, um, break down the one kilometer into four 250 meters, you might start off nice and easy. And then my next keyword is going to be stretch. I'm going to start stretching out. Then I'm going to drive and I'm going to push or dig deep, wherever it might be. And that's how we can emotionally dissect our one kilometer sprint, for example. If I want to do it technically, this is where when we're tired, we have a, a, a cognitive capacity. We can only compute a certain amount of information. Now, when we're tired, that is even harder, right? It becomes even more difficult. And much like a phone, if you're trying to store all this data on your phone, at a certain point, it's going to say, right, you need to get rid of something. You need to replace it. Like, I, can't, I can't keep up with this. You get that buffering circle and the computer says no, right? Well, that's what happens in our races. In those moments, what we need to do is we need to chunk our information down into sympathetic chunks that will help our brain to process it rather than trying to recall all the information of how I'm meant to execute this movement for argument's sake. Because when you're tired, your form do drops, increases your risk of injury, but also makes the movement less efficient and not as fast. So you need something there to prompt you. So let's say on the rowing, for example, it might be chest high. That might be the prompt that you need. And that's a technical prompt. That's a technical keyword that, you know, all right, that, if I execute that that part of that that word, execute that movement, then my my uh, my exercise will perform well. Okay. 
I think per- personally speaking as well, there's uh, th- there's times in the race where you can like tap out a little bit mentally, and there's times where it's like, okay, you can make mistakes here, or I, I need to count my laps here. But like on the ski, if you're on the ski for four minutes, you haven't got like really f- be focusing on for that four minutes. That it's a time mm. to tap out, and similar on the rower, mm-hmm. like for me at least, like it's, it's time to sit down. Like there's not a lot that can go wrong necessarily at the rower. Touch wood. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but then there's other times where you, where you know like if, if you're coming into like the rock zone you're coming in to do a station it's like right i need to mentally switch on make sure i'm going to the right place know where i'm going at that point so there's like there's times in the race where it is in time to switch on times where you can switch off a little bit more i think love yeah. that yeah using your focus yeah um uh how about like from an injury perspective if you're if you're working with someone um this struggling with an injury m- mentally struggling with an injury maybe it's holding them back um mm-hmm. is there any any sort of like any sort of advice you'd give them if 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 they were struggling from that perspective yeah most <laughs> injuries are a pig right <laughs> i think every <laughs> athlete you speak to any athlete they hate injuries right and rightly so um as someone has gone through one recently i can probably speak from quite personal experience as well was well with my athletes the problem with injuries is from one day you go from living in line with who you believe yourself to be being able to complete this one hour workout without any issue at all uh to the next day sitting on the sofa and able to move or well, the worst case or just not being able to go to the gym to do the full workout that you want to do we get this conflict with our identity who we perceive ourselves to be and that's the biggest thing we're starting to see that uh, who i am the actions that i'm doing daily isn't the person that i believe myself to be and who who i've seen myself be the past few months like performing all these workouts that creates a lot of anxiety uh, it decreases your motivation what's the point like i'm not doing it it decreases your competence your perceived confidence as well like I, I can't do this anymore it's a process of rebuilding and what a lot of people do wrong is when they're injured is they keep the same level of expectations and when they, well, I'm going to get back to the gym when I can do that full hour again, or I'm going to try, only when I can lift X weight will I be able to go back to the squat rack, whatever it might be. Well, injury, you're setting yourself up to fail in that situation. If that's your expectation, but your performance is not going to meet that expectation because physical handicaps, right? You create this gap. And in this gap, we call it, I guess, the performance expectation gap. Anxiety resides there. And if we constantly find ourselves in this gap all the time, then we're never going to get back to the gym. It's going to be harder to get back to, to performing at our best. And now that's hard for an athlete to hear because we set our expectations high. We want to perform well all the time. But in doing so, we're actually inhibiting ourselves from getting back to where we want to be. And sometimes it is just changing the way that we measure. So, for example, our work is very much quantitative based. Numbers, how fast you run weights how much you lift and for how long when you're injured those numbers aren't going to be the same so sometimes it's better to lean on another form of measurement qualitative so give it context so how did that feel how did that movement feel how was it compared to last session like how have you improved in other aspects other than the numerical values that you put on the bar or that you the miles that you run because you're you're only like you're making yourself down to be just a number and then your identity is revolved around that and because you're injured you can't achieve that so you're constantly going to be unable to achieve what you're trying to achieve so injury is very much building blocks i need to change my process of developing and measuring my performance and celebrating small wins things that you wouldn't have celebrated for example say you know you can run a 5k in 20 minutes well maybe Running a 5k for first all might be good if you're injured. But for another person, oh no, but a few months ago I could do that easy. Like that was no problem at all. I think that's not your reality now. So you need to adjust your way that you're measuring and rating yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so following on from that, I guess I was going to ask you about goal setting and yeah, uh, yeah, like it, it, in higher ops, either you've you've run a race before and you're you know probably trying to beat your previous time or you're doing it for the first time and you're trying to get X time because that's what you've seen, whatever other people do. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you think about like goal setting? Is it, 
you know, do, do, would you advise completely against that approach and focus more on the, on trusting the process and all that sort of things? Is is it finding a balance? Mm. Where do you stand with that? Goal setting is a lot more nuanced than people think. They think, oh, I set a goal, I'm going to run my Horrocks in a sub 90 minutes, whatever it might be. Um, okay, great. That's a goal. Yes, it is a goal. It's a performance-based goal, but there's a lot more to consider in that it's not got a plan there's no objective there to get there like yes you're doing the training each and every day but a goal needs to be broken down into its constituent parts it's like i'm going to go climb everest okay yeah but where are you going to stop along the way where are you going to rest where's your checkpoints to hit to make sure you're going on the right course because who knows you might not even be climbing everest you might be climbing the mountain next to it right <laughs> so goal setting is very similar to that you need to make sure that you've got a plan so i guess the way that i'd break it down is you've got that outcome goal and that's exactly what we're talking about there whatever your performance goal is maybe for your competition well that could be performance based so like a time or it could be mastery based and now the two sides of the coin there are mastery is about self-development improving constantly it's great for long-term motivation performance based is more numerically quantitative uh, about actually hitting a number for example like a certain time and it's great for short-term motivation but long-term not so much because it's almost like when you're at work, you finish a document, you go to file, open a new document, you're presented with a new pl blank page. It's like, I might just go grab a coffee before I start this. That's why you see a lot of people when they they run a race or they do a, some sort of event and then they just fall off the wagon for a few months rather than getting back into the next one, right? Whereas mastery is constantly trying to achieve more. So you've got your mastery or your performance goal, the cyber outcome. Below that, you then have your milestone goals. So those are going to be the things. Say, for example, you're on a free month prep, 12 weeks. Each month, what is a milestone that I need to hit to make sure that I will achieve that outcome? Hold yourself accountable. Make sure we've got a plan of action to be able to get there. Rather than it being, I'm just going to see if I can do this. Uh, that is my goal. Because ultimately, three months is a long time. And there's going to be a point along that prep where you're going to get demotivated. Those milestone goals will keep you motivated along the way. They're things to hit for. And then to your point at the end, the process goals. And those things are the minutiae goal setting. Those things are the things that are overlooked all the time. They're almost like the daily habits, right? These are the things that you're going to do each and every day that if you continue to do those, live in accordance with those goals, you will achieve the milestone goals, which then will allow you to achieve the outcome goals. So my granddad used to say, take care of the pennies and the pound take care, pounds take care of themselves. Exact same concept. The process goals are the pennies. The outcome goals are the pounds. Focus on the process the outcome will be bound to happen or increase your chances of happening anyway. Mm -hmm. What's your, uh, what's your thoughts on, on social media uh, on this <laughs> side of things? Like, I mean, that's, that's a broad question, but like yeah. people, you know, maybe define their expectations of themselves and their times by, by looking on social media. Do you think it's, uh, is it generally a bad thing like <laughs> to, to, to be on there? <laughs> It's, in, it's yeah it's the debate isn't it that's the question <laughs> um so i've seen both sides of the coin from uh from clients i've seen some clients come to me and say oh, just i'm getting rid of this competition but all i see is these people lifting so much more than me running yeah. so much faster than me like what's the point like, well, why am i even turning up because naturally we're there to be competitive i'm gonna lose i'm losing before i even go so what's the point i've then seen other people that said they were so doubtful about their abilities I looked on social media and I'm so much faster than them. I had no idea. And I've been training like a year less. Okay. It's really powerful in that situation. Well, I think we need to take a little bit of a, <laughs> our approach to social media needs to be, um, we need to be careful with it to ensure. So when we use social media, we're creating an environment. And that environment, because each time we go onto our phones, and we swipe through, that's going to be, it's almost like our fitness class. If I went to a fitness class and I was the big fish, I was faster, stronger, and better than everyone else, I'd feel amazing. I feel so motivated, so confident. If I then went to a new fitness class and all of a sudden I was the slowest, I wasn't the strongest at all, I'd feel pretty bad. Our motivation and our perceived competence, how well we perceive ourselves to be, is based on who we're comparing ourselves to. And we're creating it artificially in our pocket every single time we open up Instagram. Now, don't get me wrong. It can be great to go on social media and see someone break a high rocks world record. And it's like, oh, that's so like fascinating. That's amazing. Like I, I, that could be, it's so inspiring. But there's some days where look, we feel awful, right? 
everyone does like you feel bleak you're like ah what's the point you're on the way back home from, from work you're on the train you're flicking through social media you've got to go to a gym session in the evening but you're not feeling up for it and also you're seeing someone your competition just smash my workout like it was absolutely amazing like i prs all around it's like oh, i don't want to see that whereas if it was maybe like, someone posted on social media oh, i didn't do very well today like but i still got at it like it was good like i could have done better i might be a little bit more motivated like ah oh, they're in the same boat as me but at least they went so i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to the gym so on those days being careful about the environment we're creating for ourselves because if you dip into that and you're not in the mood to receive that information it's not going to be helpful but if you're in the mood for it it can be the best thing since sliced bread yeah, yeah. i guess it's like awareness of how it's affecting you and what you yeah. need as well at, at certain times yeah yeah exactly that yeah yeah okay are there any uh do you have any sporting heroes or, or heroines or anyone like you, you you look up to as being like psychologically amazing or anything like that? It's interesting you say that. So many people ask me this question and I never really know who to say. Like I, I've followed a lot of sport growing up and I love a lot of people. And I think social media, like we've spoken about, we've spoken about earlier, you can start to learn a bit more about them. Um, but on the field, for example, in football, like you can see how people hold themselves. Like, okay, they seem like they've got uh, got something about them. Uh, like Declan Rice, for example, I'm a West Ham fan, unfortunately. Um, gone to Arsenal, but I think he's a great character. I think he's shows great qualities, right, as a sportsman. Um, but ultimately, I always land on the same thing, and this may sound a tiny bit narcissistic, but <laughs> my the sportsman that I always look up to is the version of myself that I wish I could become, and I'm striving to achieve. Right. That's the person that I want to be. That's the person that the values that I hold near and dear to my heart. And that's the most motivating thing. Rather than seeing someone else doing it is the fact that I could be that person. And as I got older, it's actually been reflecting on who I was growing up. Being like, you know, what? I have achieved some really good things. And this goes back to the competence thing right at the start. Reflecting on things that you have achieved. That could be the most inspiring things rather than trying to live your life through someone else's lens. Look, we are the main character for each and every person. We are the main character. So indulge in it. Why not feel that confidence? You've achieved things yeah. in the past. Relive it. Yeah, yeah, love it. I guess in your job as well, like you see that even if from the outside, some of these top sportsmen are like, like apparently like got it all together. Like yeah. often they haven't, you know, behind the yeah. scenes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, tell us more about your your app. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. So yeah, so get ahead mindset, um, get ahead a mental training plans on on the App Store and Google Play. Uh, so it's myself, I'm the head of mental fitness, and we've got our founders Adam and Chris. Uh, Adam is a fellow sports psychologist. Chris got a bit, uh, background in business consultancy. Uh, former professional rugby players. Basically, we knew that the mindset side of sport is massive. Everyone harks on about it. How amazing, how important it is. It's ninety percent of my performance how many people train it right it's normally chicken and egg situation i train hard physically so i build mental fortitude super great but some people don't have the tools to be able to even do that they need the mental side to facilitate the physical transformation and for the people that have developed that supposed mental toughness what well, if i could tell you that i could dissect some uh research from the top athletes in the world and i can make it easy digestible and consumable for you to be able to take away and apply to your fitness so that you can get that extra 1%. And that's what we're doing. We're using content that's evidence-backed in one to three minute snippet audios, paired with activities, paired with tracking and uh, different mental techniques so that you can actually train your mindset, creating a training ground for that mindset and building the mentality you need to get the most out of, in this case, your high rocks, but if you want to run a marathon, run an ultra, wherever it might be. Okay. Awesome. All right, and so that's it's, it's get ahead. Yeah, they they just find it yeah. on the on the Play Store and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Instagram get ahead mindset. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for this. This is this has been fantastic. Any, anything else I should have asked you? <laughs> I think you did very well there. Exhausted it. I love it. Thanks so much. <laughs> all right. All right. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers.